Welcome back, everybody. We're back with Nan Man's Nerd Corner. As always, we've got our big episode that gets filtered in with our kind of little episodes we've been doing. I am Nan, and joined with me is my wonderful co-host, Jaime. How you doing, bud? We haven't heard from you in a little bit. Yeah. You're surviving? <laughs> yeah, I did pretty good. Just... Uh, uh, Got a lot of got a lot of stuff. Works been busy, and then uh, got a wedding coming up in October. So obviously, uh, that's keeping me busy as well. So apologies to everyone for uh, being a hot minute before we got another uh, <laughs> chance to record and, and talk a little nerd. That's all right. We've been everybody else has been able to listen and, and nerd it out about magic because that's been our. Usually, when I don't get to record with you, I get into the uh, the filler episodes, and it's just me talking about magic stuff because you know there was a ban list update, and, and me starting to go back and play modern again. So there's been there's been some stuff happening in the, in the magic world that I've been uh, podcasting Whoa. about doing doing my solo stuff. So, but yeah, now we've got our our kind of uh, duo back together, and we're going to be doing kind of a r- recap slash update episode because we've had a couple of stuff that a uh, podcast episode we've done so far uh, one about collecting one about uh, the spider verse and one about diablo so we're going to kind of do an episode that highlights those and we're also going to kind of lean into boulders gate in this episode because that's kind of the the big gaming news and game that is kind of going around uh of basically the internet at this point in time right a lot of the time we're, there are specific games that latch on for people and they get obsessed with and boulders gate is kind of that newest one so that's that's kind of our, our road map and if we get off the road and go you know off on tangents you know it's likely to happen on this episode because it's not we're not honed in on one specific thing there are going to be more episodes like that uh in the future right where we've got an anime one that's getting planned out it's in the works we're going to be doing probably i'll get you in for a full magic one at some point you know, we got uh, a lot of stuff to discuss, but this one's going to be kind of just like going through things and, and updating stuff. So, yeah, fun. Are, you, are you ready? You feeling ready? Oh, yeah. I'm, oh, I'm ready. And fun fact for everybody listening. Uh, I am also one of those people addicted to Baldur's Gate. So uh, when they were saying it's uh, been big talk of the Internet and we've uh, been playing a good amount of it, I've really enjoyed it. And when we get to that part, I'm pretty excited to, to talk about it because also going to get two different perspectives someone who's been playing the game a lot and then someone who's got you know quite a bit of experience with D and doing some dming and things like that so it'd be really good to you know see it from both perspectives and such so i'm excited i'm excited for today's uh today's talk nice nice so uh let's jump in do like collecting uh and talk that news um i have been on the the reserve side of things of going there are a lot of cool stuff out where I live uh, that I have not pulled the trigger on on going to. Um, so two of which is there's a very large flea market uh, by me. Uh, and the other one is recently they have this very large uh, yard crawl thing. It's called the Route 11 like yard crawl. That's basically like from one town to another and just from the entire path of this, this one road, everybody just sets up tables and vendors and you can, you can buy stuff. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the collecting that I watch on YouTube of people doing collecting, especially like retro game collecting, go to weekly flea markets and they go do these things. And I keep like, they're on my radar of the stuff that's around me. And I'm just like, I know that if I go to these, I'm going to buy a bunch of stuff. <laughs> so I'm like, I know I'm, I'm trying really hard not to. So I, I did not go to the Route 11 thing, but I'm like, I think next year I'm just going to go. I'm just going to pull the trigger and just just go and, and see what I what I can find. And, and I've also thought about, you know what? I could just wake up like early on a Saturday and go. But then a lot of times on, on Fridays, we're hanging out late playing <laughs> games and stuff. So it's like, I have to like, plan ahead to do these but i don't know have you like have you done any of that like yard sailing or 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 flea market stuff or any of that uh so (laughs) it's it's funny when uh i didn't want to interrupt you but it was funny when you're talking about like i've kept myself from going to those uh i (laughs) i feel like that would be very dangerous for you uh and i mean no offense by this the reason (laughs) no uh, that's exactly like it's 100 (laughs) percent. like i it's like i'm aware of it and i think everybody around me knows it too it's just like because i like to I like stuff <laughs> uh, well, well that's the thing it's like with a lot of those too like I, well, I would argue a more on the danger side for you uh is because like 
you are a collector and there's a lot of things that you find a lot of uh, personal value, but you also like to like keep things for an extended period of time and watch them grow in value through that extended period of time. I think a lot of people who, there, there's both obviously, there's all over the spectrum in terms of, of those uh, uh, yard sales and things of that nature, but a lot of people go to flip a quick profit um, which would be a little bit more challenging. I know I, I try to avoid them in the same way because I kind of have that same issue. I would buy a bunch of stuff and then just keep it because I'm like, oh, this is really cool. I want to keep this or, mm-hmm. you know, so it's, I've done it before. I've done a couple um, in the town that I live in. They do like a big, uh, like, it's like a weekend yard sale thing. And, and I think it's usually, it, they, I say a weekend, but it's like a Saturday, you know, fleet market, like everybody puts out their tents and, and so on. And, two or three people who set up tents in, in the town are like big comic book collectors or big, mm. you know, there's a collectible toys. There's been somebody who set up a thing about like old video games and stuff. So I always make sure to hit those because you never know. You might find a hidden gem uh, right, right. and, and want to keep it. But yeah, those, <laughs> unless you're making a living and flipping, those are going to be very dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And, and there are people that do make that that living as resellers and mm-hmm. they go to those specifically to go i'm looking for like these items that i can pick up for cheap and flip for profit even if it's like a couple bucks or you know sometimes they get really big profits depending on how you know old an item is or how sought after an item is and so i like i've, I've been kind of falling down that rabbit hole of the uh, retro game collecting youtube and and watching a lot of that and so i'm like i i don't have the same attachment and nostalgia for a lot of the retro stuff that these guys do right uh you know like i i played games and stuff growing up and we had systems but we were we were a playstation household um so it was like you know there's specific titles that i know okay yes we enjoy but a lot of the specific titles like when we played crash and spyro and and things like that they've remade them now and i have them on the switch but like some of the other ones like i i do have specific games like you know, Twisted Metal and Jet Moto and these kind of multiplayer oh, PlayStation Jet games. Oh, Moto, dude. You know? I remember that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the nostalgia is hitting me big right now. It's, 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 <laughs> like, it's stuff like this. And I go, it would be cool to, like, have those at one point, but I'm not, like, actively... Because there's other stuff that I'm collecting, right? Like, of course, Magic's a big one. Right. I have... I, I kind of got back into the retro Pokemon collecting and creating decks for Pokemon. But it's like, I d- I'm not really expect the, the thing with Pokemon, and it's hard because I can't really go to a flea market or things like that to pick up the Pokemon because Pokemon is such a thing in the forefront that it's it's enough common knowledge that everybody knows about Pokemon, mm-hmm. right? If you, go, you've go, if you go to a flea market, everybody knows, oh, Pokemon are worth value, right? not necessarily the ones that they're selling are worth value right they have a a lot of people might just buy new collections where i only care about you know the very old stuff and i don't care if it's damaged or beat up or stuff i because i'm using them to play with i'm not right i'm not sitting here going i want this graded you know nine like hollow shadowless charizard you know that's worth thousands of dollars i'm not seeking that out i'm like i want this beat up one that i can get for like twelve (laughs) dollars There's a big bend in it, and you like the yeah, foil yeah. coming off the corner. That's that's what I'm. <laughs> Can't recognize out. the Pokemon. You're like, guess that Pokemon because the card is so beat up. You have no idea what the hell it is. Exactly. So like that, you know, I've I've got my own collections of that. I I did get started on, back on collecting manga, uh, but because I've got that disposable income, I can just be like, I'm just going to buy the full collection. Or in the case of uh, there's a couple of books that are being released now in hardback that now i'm buying like oh you know every couple of months i'll i'll pull the trigger and buy a hardback of of this manga and stuff so there's like two series that i'm collecting in hardback but i bought all of the um what what series did i just buy i bought uh one all in paperback um demon slayer oh i just bought the whole collection of it i was just like all right here you go just buy it flat out but it's again it's that like disposable income thing of of how am i spending my nerd nerd budget and so like with with magic releasing these like sets like commander masters it's like well i'm not gonna spend hundreds of dollars on this box normally because i love buying boxes and cracking packs 
All right, it's fun to just do that. And then I go, okay, anything I don't get or whatever, or if there's something that I specifically really want, I'll buy the singles of. But if I'm just enjoying opening packs and, and seeing what I get from that and having fun with that and seeing what I build from those, you know, that's fun to me. But when they're making sets be hundreds of dollars and then immediately they start losing value and nobody wants to buy them because they're too expensive, it's like a whole a whole mess in in this the world of of, po or of uh magic right now with that commander master set well so. it's like a lottery ticket too right you're like you get that it adrenaline is. rush you're like holy moly like you bought a you know I, heck i think when the one ring was still being hunted by everybody i mm. was looking for places to get some pack because i was like hey man you never know i might might get lucky like Obviously, you know, the, the real person inside of me, the realism or the realistic human being was like, there's no way in hell that's happening. But I'm still going to like give it a couple of chances, you know. Um, right. And it's well, that's I mean, that's that's really interesting, like because we haven't really talked about that on the podcast is that, mm -hmm. you know, the hunt for the one ring. And, and, you know, for those that are familiar with magic, you guys, you know, probably had heard about it. And even if you're not familiar with magic, there was this whole thing of it was a one of one serialized card being released. Uh, you know, so a guaranteed one of one, which is unheard of in the world of, of magic. They have tested out serialized cards. Usually it's about one 500 or so, or one in 300, you know, like there's these varying numbers, but an actual one of one, uh, it was found by a guy up in Canada uh, he was able to uh, flip it to Post Malone for two million dollars, and he's he came out and said like you know, I, you know, I'm not gonna be spending this on a brand new car, or new you know like new house and things like that. I, you know, I've already set aside this money in savings that I've I basically got with some financial advisors and set it up that I'm making money off of the money now, so it, that is paying for my you know rent and my food and stuff like that and the money that i make at my job is just going towards like fun stuff and then i can essentially retire at the age of like 55 holy so like, That's... moly so he's he's figured out how to properly invest his money to do that so i was like that's you know what good on you good on you for that and good on post for for deciding to buy it right because he's him and and cassius marsh there are like the two people that i know of in the magic world that are like can throw around that kind of money and and change someone's life like that so. i'm not gonna lie to you i probably if i'd gotten lucky enough to get that uh, one ring i i would have been super static to have post uh buy it honestly yeah. i probably would give him a little bit of a discount i, I would have taken a hit just to like sit down and play a game of magic <laughs> with him and give him a fucking hug but you know he did <laughs> and he got to sit down and play magic with him anyway when he gave the card so it's like <laughs> yeah, that's fair i guess <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, so that's, you know, collecting world. There's there's crazy stuff. I don't know. One of these days we'll have to get Nick on and chat with him about the world of sports collecting because I think that would be interesting to see from the – because, like, you and I know it from, like, Yu-Gi-Oh! and, and Magic and, and that side of things. Um, relatively but the new sports side of things. So. Yeah, because I would yeah. argue that's, like, the, relevant, the relatively new side of collecting. It's funny. Earlier you said – uh, you were talking about like Pokemon and how it's such a like brand name in general that everyone knows about Pokemon to some sort of extent or degree, even adults or, or any sort of person who may not entirely have played the game or know about the cards know enough to understand the value behind Pokemon. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because I feel like, and this would be to your point, a great thing to get Nick on and get his opinion about uh, sports cards. I think that's a market that you have to i mean you really have to know what you're looking for that's one of those like undervalued markets where people have treasures and they don't even realize that they do uh and that's mm. i think where a lot of people flip and profit is they go and see valuable sports cards get a good deal on them hold on to them for a while get them graded and then they make a lot of money um so i i think there's definitely a big and even when this whole like when the whole pandemic thing happened, uh, you remember the whole thing with grading cards and how they were backlogged for like two and a half years. Oh, and yeah. The sport picked up. A lot more people were like selling cards, and it's become even bigger than what it was before. It's because some might argue it's been relatively popular and, and, and big for for many years in terms of uh, at least sports collecting. 
And ever since that happened, people were just like, oh, I might have some cards in my, you know, grandpa's attic. And they're like, oh, look at that. I have $100,000 just chilling in the attic. I didn't even know, like, that kind of crap. You're <laughs> yeah, just like, Jesus. Right. <laughs> but it's cool to see. Like, I, I do. It's funny hearing you talk about that. That's something that I was considering getting into is starting to collect Pokemon uh, back up. And, and actually, <laughs> again, back to Mick, seeing his really cool, like, sports cards displays made me be like, oh, I, could, I might try to collect some of my favorite Pokemon cards and like rarer sets of, of particular Pokemon I like and put it in a display case and have that be like my my trophy case per se. I mean it seems good. Like I keep I am always, you know, keeping an eye on eBay for certain graded Pokemon just so I can get an idea of what the price is. Cause like I I had the same idea of like, you know what, my my favorite ones I'm going to pick up like great like Scyther, my favorite Pokemon. I have it in a bunch of the Pokemon decks that I play because it works really well in the vintage Pokemon world scene of the actual like base set to fossil and base set to and, and beyond sets that you can play like uh, in the old school Pokemon. So it's like Scyther is, is awesome. And so I keep looking around like the pricing of like a, a graded 10 Scyther and stuff and you know getting an idea for okay, if I pick this up, what does it actually go for how much are they actually selling for what where can i steal a deal kind of thing for it sure yeah and that's a cool thing about it I, I think that's the other thing uh worth mentioning for me personally i think that's what i really enjoy about collecting in general is the hunt uh mm -hmm. component of it um i like you know trying to find a good deal on ebay i like just kind of stumbling across something at a store and be like oh that's so really cool this is a really good opportunity and then i also just kind of like the, the you know what I said earlier about just the chances of oh I bought a pack it, it seems like I'm doing it a lot more I've been trying to like pull back a little bit but whenever I'm near like a store or like a target or anywhere else I'm like ah cool and what do they have you know I just go quote unquote air quotes the uh, <laughs> browse the Pokemon section to see if there's any mm. like good value packs because sometimes you know five dollars six dollars however many however much one of those packs costs the some of the you know some of the sets tend to yield better results and you can get a good pull and, and make make some money so sometimes I just will we'll play that lottery from that regard but yeah it's I think sound it, I was like it sounds like we got to get you get you on the hunt then you gotta you gotta start <laughs> going to those like yard sales and the flea markets and and, and get that hunt in you <laughs> well and it's funny because I also am a firm believer uh, that I in in the idea that I think if you are nerdy to some sort of degree or geeky or you like certain things, you're almost kind of innately a collector because you're spending a lot of time and things in a hobby that you enjoy or playing a game that you really like. So having things that represent that particular hobby or interest to you almost kind of like they go hand in hand. So I think mm -hmm. like, you know, I'll use myself as an example. I really like Gundams and that got me, or I really like Gundam the show and have really liked it through the many years and that got me into Gunpla and uh, building them and, and kind of starting to put them in throughout the office and things of that nature. So it's like, they, I, I almost feel like they go in hand in hand and you almost can't avoid <laughs> finding yourself heading in one direction if you've been in the other for, for a very long time. <laughs> Oh yeah, exactly. Especially like once once you get older and you start getting that disposable income, that you're just like, yeah, this Ooh. this is the natural progression uh, of things. There, I mean, that's kind of like, you know, I I think that's that's really what it is. It's like you find these things that you enjoy, and you go, okay, what if I lean into that a little bit more? Like I like the, pretty much my main comic book collection that I have is Spider Man comics. Like I have a couple other that have like dispersed in there, but it all started with like the civil war like tradebacks that i got the big books of it and i'm like oh these are like awesome let me start collecting all the tradebacks of the civil wars era stuff that they had and then i started going oh, okay now let me you know find a little bit more of, of spider-man story from there and then it just sort of branched out until you know i got what i did and then it was like right around that like superior spider-man error oh. like that was amazing spider-man 700 start of superior spider-man it's like i got about like the first 10 books of superior spider-man and then i just kind of fell off and got sucked into another nerd hobby for a bit and was like oh, okay i'll just i'll go back to the trade backs for a while but i did those like you know getting those uh comics and going to to the comic book shop and picking up stuff was you know 
part of the fun of, of, of the collecting and, and it's easy to kind of get into that i guess yeah for anybody who has not uh read superior spider-man uh it is very very good i really like it um and i would highly recommend it <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but speaking of Spider-Man, we got some sort of updates related to Spider-Man that we can talk about if we're going through our update stuff, like, uh, specifically into the Spider-Verse, you know, we, we loved it. We've raved about it. We, I'm sure we'll do at the end of the year, kind of a, a 2023 movie episode and talk about the movies we've watched and and maybe do a a rating or something like that. Uh, but you know, both you and I have rated Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse very high on our list so far of, of movies that we've enjoyed for this year. But, you know, there is a writer strike. There's an actor strike. They have posted up that the next Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse movie is delayed indefinitely at this point. It's, you know, it's to be expected. Uh, there's also discussions about, you know, Hey, we d- want to make sure that there's proper, uh, you know, working environments for the animators because there was some stuff that came out of a lot of animators quitting just with the demand and pressure because, you know, you, you got to release a movie. Here's your deadlines. Yeah. And we want it to look good. So, uh, yeah, there was a whole discussion about that. But it's, you know, the whole thing about proper working environments is always going to be a, a thing. All right. We see it in game studios all the time. It seems to crop up, but that's a whole different topic altogether there. But, you know, do you anticipate things will, will work out that maybe we'll see it by the end of 2024, like an, a December release? Or do you think it's not even going to be 2024? It's going to be a 2025 thing. Yeah, this is the thing. I, I you know me uh, and, and then it's known me for a very long time. I'm unfortunately, uh, more of the pessimistic human being than the optimistic. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm hoping that things will get resolved, hopefully to the point where it won't push it too far, too far out or, or too late in 2024. Um, I think potentially it could be a late 2024 release, maybe an early 2025, uh, you know, around maybe, January, February time. Uh, it's tough, right? Because it you you love the content and you love all the different things that, that um, are being put together and, and, and delivered as these products that we go and enjoy in, in the theaters and stuff. So it's such a tough like conversation slash environment to, to be in where you're not really getting recognized for the level of work and and, and effort that you're putting into things to make it of that high quality. One of the things that we talked about with Spider-Man was just how how in-depth the animation was, how much effort was put into it. You brought up a very interesting topic about the different type of webbing that was used in a different movie and incorporating that into mm-hmm. Spider-Man to make it more flowing and feeling better and and, and that. So it's 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 tough, right? Because you're just like, you want things to get resolved so that you can see your thing. Selfishly, you want things to get resolved so you can kind of be on that same timeline for things. But at the same time, I'm wanting and we're wanting things to be favorable for the creators who are putting all the hard work to make it so their art and their beautiful pieces come to light in such a like better way than they're recognized for. It. And they're getting the rewards that they deserve for all the hard work that they're putting in. So I'm hoping, I don't think it's... I think there's been enough delay between everything that's been happening that it's going to be a late 2024 if we're lucky, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree with that. It's like it's hard to 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 say one of the – hopefully everything gets figured out. You know, I, I've i been one that it's been because of the writer strike, because of the actor strike. You know, if there is media out there that I enjoy – you know, I'm, I'm doing my best to try to support it. So I've been going to the movies a lot more, uh, you know, went and saw Oppenheimer. I uh, just went and saw Blue Beetle. I have oh, not seen the Barbie movie yet. Uh, Holly's seen it twice. So it's on my list to see Barbie. Uh, I'll see it at some point. Uh, Blue Beetle was uh, very good. I enjoyed it as a origin uh, superhero movie. Um, you know, my I am an MCU fan and i consume every mcu piece of 
of media and content that's out there. Um, DCU, I have been impressed with a couple of their movies. Um, right, I like the first Wonder Woman movie. They did a very good job with it. The second one, not so much. Um, so I was like, eh, I never, I didn't watch the Flash movie. The trailer of it looked cool. Uh, at some point, I'll probably watch it, but I just, eh. Uh, you know, like I was, I was not, I liked the first, uh, Shazam movie. The second one, not so much. <laughs> I don't know. Black Adam. I was like, nah, not for me. Not, <laughs> not for me. Like it's so th- like blue beetle. I, I enjoyed it as an origin movie. They, it, it had the, the humor to it that reminded me a little bit of like the first Shazam, that it was it it felt genuine and not like it was over the top humor where some of the Shazam stuff was over the top humor, but it was, you know, for a origin one because my initial knowledge of Blue Beetle came from the DC deck building game. That that was a real like the first time I ever interact with him, and pretty much the most that I've interacted with the Blue Beetle was through that. So like going into it, I didn't have as much knowledge of him so it was nice that they kind of went through it you know they're uh, without getting too much spoilers because the movie just came out and people are going to see it or at least i hope they're going to see it uh i know that there are people that you know wait for certain movies to go on streaming and watch it but because i'm actively trying to support actors and stuff like that through their projects if it's a movie that i am interested in seeing i'm going to go see it in theater instead of waiting just so i can help help in that regard i don't know that, that's the way my brain works for it but you know that be it, it it big disclaimer representation matters it's awesome to see such a uh family oriented theme throughout the entire movie but part of that is because of the uh you know it's a hispanic superhero that's very close with his family so it's like that's a big theme and juxtaposition with the villain of not really having that family connection and so it's like you know it was very nice in that regard of of clear setups and and how they they set up the theme for it uh the blue beetle suits and all that stuff was cool uh what did cody say last night he gave the perfect description of it i'm trying to think it was he he said it was green lantern Mixed oh, with... Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Like, oh, That's a sore said, subject for me, bro. <laughs> no, no, I know. Not not, not like the movies, like the character, Green Lantern's character and his powers. Okay. Uh, in, in that regard. So he said it was, it was I want to say it was Encanto mix with green lantern i think is the way that he described okay. it and I, okay. <laughs> I was like i you know what that's a very good it's, i, I want to say it was some, something along those lines it's you know i'm, I'm paraphrasing essentially here but but it, it definitely had that like very family feel blue beetles powers if you don't know are very similar to green lanterns in that regard of hey if you can think of this weapon you can now create this weapon right Right. So 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 that's where he gets that green. Not the Green Lantern movie, which I never saw, because again, I, I I just have not been impressed with the DC stuff. Also, another reason why I went and saw this Blue Beetle is because this is the first real introduction into James Gunn's DC universe. Yes, Blue Beetle is going to be playing a part and the extended larger picture of the DC universe that they are going to be creating. So it was very cool to be able to see that. Uh, also complete side note, the actor that played blue beetle Zolo, I think his name is or something yep. uh, was, was just playing commander with Brian Kibler. <laughs> that, okay. That makes me love this so much more because I, I love him from, um, from Cobra Kai um, so if anybody mm-hmm. has seen Cobra Kai on Netflix, I, I love the show. Um, there is no in between. You either think it's the dumbest shit in the entire planet or you really like it. I yet to find someone who's in the middle where they're like, ah, it's okay. I like it sometimes. I don't. Either you like love it and you're like, this is so good and corny and nostalgic. And other people are like, this is so dumb. Why am I watching this? 
Uh, <laughs> I think he's a great actor. Um, mm-hmm. I was really excited. The reason I was asking is because I I, I really like that character and that hero, uh, Blue Beetle. And mm-hmm. interestingly enough, um, we kind of learned a little bit more about him. You're right, when we were playing the DC deck building game. And I remember kind of stumbling across him a long, long time ago uh, when... Um, this is gonna be this is gonna be a gut punch to some of our uh, older listeners. When Big Bad <laughs> Beetleboards was on TV, and I remember Ooh. searching that, and then Blue Beetle came up as one of like the different searches, and I remember learning a little bit more about that because I was all into that whole like Power Rangers, Big Bad Beetleboards, mm-hmm. anything that was like a cybernetic augmentation yep. augmentative suit of some sort. And that makes sense. Yeah, and the character and, and the story just seemed really really cool. Um, I was. I'm hoping that the movie does well because I was I was really worried. I was reading a, a and, and watching a couple of videos about like the you know like Mission Impossible apparently had like a fifty or was expected to lose fifty million dollars. Uh, Indiana mm-hmm. Jones was expected to lose fifty million dollars. This was not even going to come close. It was going to be one of the biggest I losing know. movies um, in, of the year. Uh, a because there hasn't really been any good advertising around it, and I'm hoping that it's just. Other reasons than, than where my mind is to go sometimes. Well, no, no. But, no part, part of like part of that is like they're allowed to have X amount in their budget for sure. advertisement, right? Sure. And, and but part of that is also usually the actors going and doing press tours and interviews and talk shows and things that nobody is allowed to do right now. Actors are not allowed to promote their movies on on. Uh, press tours and and things like that that they normally would be allowed to do uh it's really just kind of the normal commercials that they are allowed to play scene, yeah and that and that's it so like that you know that's a big thing too with you know some of the actors that would normally be like oh i would be on hot ones or i would be on this talk show right <laughs> like you know like these normal things that they would sit there and be able to promote their movie get people to come out and see it they can't they're not allowed to while the strike is is going on now i did i did have a quick question about the movie and this is if we're going too much into the spoilers component of it uh you know stop me and just be like i can't say oh we'll talk offline but i am curious how, did they do a fairly decent job between the ai of the beetle itself and Jaime Reyes's characters like interactions and how they communicate and things like that because like that's a big part of his character and kind of how he almost kind of flips it right because the the whole Blue Beetle concept is it's a world ending machine it belongs to the colony right and there's a whole uh, Young Justice I think did an entire season on this which they did magnificently well and I think my my main point with going down this this question slash tangent a little bit is I feel like DC really has the animated market down in terms mm-hmm. of like Young Justice. I remember growing up with Justice League, uh, Justice League Unlimited. Uh, a lot of people will hear all these and, and recognize these and seen at least some episodes if you didn't watch from start to finish. So it's it's kind of, as you said, it, it has me a little bit excited to have Gunn bring this universe to light because there's so many, not not... Dishing on Marvel, I know we got some hardcore Marvel fans that tell me to go fuck myself along with DC. Uh, but there's some good storyline. There's really, really good storyline. The Darkest Night from the Green Lantern series. Yeah. They have they have really good opportunity to pull, you know, not only from their animated stuff, but uh, a bunch of different things. Injustice. Um, there's mm-hmm. so many good things that would make there's such good movies. There's 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 Free content, they're just boiling, boiling for someone to come and grab it so that people will it's, enjoy it. And, and it's an untapped market that I hope that they'll start to navigate and execute well because I think, you know, we've talked, uh, Nan and I have talked about this many times off, off, uh, off the podcast. Marvel has had 10 to 15, 20 plus years of developing mm-hmm. their universe, releasing movies. One sucked, one was great, the other one... So they, they figured out the formula that works for them. And DC, I felt like for a long time, was trying to copy that instead of just making it their own. They don't need and, to be Marvel. Yeah. They can be their own thing. As they should. Yeah, and I, I, I think they should. So I've, I've got two things for that. So it, to answer your question, they did do a good job of it within the context of the movie of showing, like, you know, the first integration of the the suit onto Jaime is like, oh, 
you know, it's designed to protect its host. Like, he, you know, a bus is coming at him. He cuts the bus in half to protect the host, you know, like these, these things. And then there's like, oh, it, it wants to use lethal weapons to protect him and, and – you know, there's that initial fight over like, no, I don't want to use lethal weapons and until the suit basically becomes a symbiotic relationship so that it shows that evolution over the course of the movie, which which I thought was really good. Okay. Um, the other thing to touch on about your, you know, the, the power of DC's animated game and why, you know, it is so much better than MCU's up to this point. Uh, James Gunn has said that the animated scene is going to be integral and tied into their DC universe. And the actors that are going to be playing the live action versions are going to be voice acting the animated versions of their characters in the same connected universe. So you'll have live action switch to animated switch. Like they'll have this kind of, you won't see so much of a separation of it because the you know the voice is going to be the same. They're they're connecting all the dots across the DCU. So I'm very excited to see what James Gunn does with it when we go into it. Actually, that's really smart. I'm 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 happy to hear that because that's such a like I said they they have they have the content. So like half of the formula is already there for them. They just need to execute it properly and and connect all the dots in a way that makes it flow. And then people will just kind of kind of you know go to it i i think this is the this is maybe where they might have a little bit advantage where i feel like marvel is kind of this is just my own personal opinion i feel like we're kind of seeing a flop you know flip-flop or, or or reversal of like marvel's now instead of the big focus being the movies it's the tv shows to connect a lot of the information pertaining mm-hmm. to the movies and trying to make both work and i know we've talked a little bit about this before i don't know that it's going to work exceptionally how they want it to um but it, it hasn't it hasn't yet yeah. right like stuff even, even when you go like the doctor strange stuff like if you, you it's like you have to have seen the development essentially from wandaverse to really appreciate and understand the the doctor strange movie like a it's like I don't know. It's it's a whole thing, and then we've got like the setup for the Marvels that is coming up. That if you did not watch, you know, essentially like three shows, right? You had to have seen uh, who this Photon character is from uh, WandaVision. You have to see Miss Marvel to understand who she is, and then you got to have some context from Secret Invasion to understand kind of the setup for the Marvel movie. Plus, you know, the original movie of of Captain Marvel. So it's like, it's, a, it's so much different IPs and connected dots that they've got, that it's, it's, a, it's a, if you're able to consume all that, you know, great. But now they're really setting it up where it's like, it's allowing a lot of fans or people that might've, you know, like that big epic end game scene, you know, are now t- tagging out and being like, I, I'm not invested anymore. You're, you're spreading yourself across all this stuff, and I, I don't have the time or energy to commit to watching all these shows. I, I want just the straightforward formula that you had for the original phases, but I don't know. I, it's going to be interesting to see how Marvel adapts and changes as DCU really powers up over the next couple of years. And it's, it's interesting or, or funny, I should say, hearing you say that, man, because I, I actually find myself in that category. Um, mm-hmm. I feel myself pulling away a little bit and not being as invested because I think the beauty that I like with Marvel previously and how they were handling their movies and, and so on was it was movies and a lot of people would see movies and have time to go see it together. So it, it, it created a bridge between those who may not be like comic book fans or didn't follow the shows or didn't understand uh, different things and give you like an even playing ground of like, hey, let me fill some of the gaps in for you so that you can kind of know a little bit more about that. It's funny you said about uh, Doctor Strange where I saw WandaVision and Mary Page, my my fiance, had not. So she was a little bit more confused during the Doctor Strange mm-hmm. movie. Whereas when she went back and saw it and understood a little bit more about what was happening, as you said, you understand what Wanda's gone through, her pain, her agony. So it's not, it doesn't come out of, <laughs> out of left field when she's like, suffering and all this agony and she wants her kids you're just like jesus that's a you know without the context of it you don't you don't get it as much and i feel like that's 
what I liked about the previous phases were like, oh yeah, here comes Endgame, here comes this. There's there's so much that you could go and you can go deeper into it, but it didn't require you to know that. You could go to the movies, watch all these movies in, you know, relative order, quote unquote, as you know, you can watch them in, in when they're happening and so on. Uh, and know enough about the context, uh, the, the content to be able to have a conversation, bridge that gap between a hardcore fan and a non-hardcore fan and, 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 and have a, a good conversation versus now that it's like, hey, have you seen, you know, the two seasons of Loki and have you seen Secret <laughs> Invasion? And, and then you have to like basically check off all these marks before you can mm-hmm. actually have a deep conversation because A, you don't want to spoil a show for someone or B, if they don't have that context, you don't really know how you're going to be able to navigate that conversation because you're not on the same page. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a really good point to it. I mean, I don't know. I've watched Secret Invasion. Um, it, it was fine for <laughs> what it was it's a setup like i was more invested at the beginning when they were like ah oh, it's it's a little bit more spy esque and i was like cool okay they're trying to do something a little different with it and then it just sort of like kind of moved away from that from the initial couple episodes and and pivoted into something else by the end of it it it, it worked for telling the story of the scrolls i guess and the evolution of them but it was like i don't know i i would have much rather it have been more you know nick fury master spy story than what it turned into but it gave an it it gave some information about like you know him leaving earth and you know what he's been doing and and like filled in some of the gaps again from some of the movies and it's like if it's one of those I, I don't know how much of it is going to tie into, you know, the Marvel movie that's coming out with, you know, Photon and Miss Marvel and Captain Marvel. I mean, we know that Nick Fury's in it and he's kind of in his space station and it explains a little bit about why, you know, why he's up there. Sure. But I don't know if you need that for the Marvel movie. So if like if you're going into it and you're like, do I need to watch this to know what's going to happen? You might not like and that's going to be weird, too, to see stuff that it's like. Is that now going to be the, the the way that they're going to do it? Is have like now here's extra stuff for people that want it, but it's not going to be necessary. Like, is that the trade off that we're going to get now? I don't know. If that's their goal and that's the plan, that I'm I'm perfectly happy with that. Mm-hmm. If that's actually if it's executed in that you know in that uh form or shape or, or manner right so like if I, if if it's not then you leave kind of that scenario that we were talking about earlier where you got dr strange you don't you didn't see wandavision you know ooh, that uh, right no sorry I, I i i'm interrupting you for a sec because that reminds me of of loki season one and the ant-man movie yes if you did not watch loki season one and got that version and that context of Kang and under like he who remains and seeing that yep. compared to the different version that we saw in Ant-Man, you wouldn't have that same like understanding or knowledge of, okay, it's the same person, but they are drastically different. And why is this so scary now? Because we're seeing, you know, just how powerful one version is, let alone the millions, no matter like, how different in personality they might be it's all bad but if you don't have that loki context so it's i don't know we're gonna we're seeing loki come back though in october right and and season, even season two and even to that other side of the coin like we were talking about earlier if you feel like the the, the content and the material is so complex in 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 some manner that you have to execute it through a show mm-hmm. or anything like that i totally get it i just think it's a bit more of a hard ask to get every yes. to, to have everyone be caught up on every show, to be able to understand the movies in that level of of, of or to, to that degree, right? Because like you're just sitting there going, "Well, I don't know, I understand what's going on here," because you or I don't understand as much as I could understand here because I missed right, that entire right. show. I, I, I mm-hmm. it's I'm glad you brought up the whole uh, Loki and and the Ant Man movie because I think that's an even greater gap in, in in knowledge from watch from lack of watching Loki to watching Ant Man and understanding kind of how that plays, especially with how the phase is progressing and yeah. who the next big villain is for their one of their main movies, right? 
So right, and and if you have seen Ant Man and you have not seen Loki, you know, go back and watch them. Also, like if it, it's important to understand that you know, even though it's the same person, they're still drastically different, and and you know, getting that knowledge for this phase is is going to be very crucial because you know they're building up for that. That's the big baddie. Right. right. Which I'm I'm hoping then that in the Marvels we're going to continue to have that tie in of, of this is the big baddie. But I think this that'll be the first real test. Right. Are there going to be Marvel movies that are coming out that don't have the same weight to them? Or like, I don't know. This they, like it's going to be interesting to see what, what they do going forward. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it'll be it'll be a good uh, what you call it. I'm curious to see how it's going to work out and, and execute. And obviously, I'm still going to go watch the movies and such. Even though, I get like, I think what I said earlier about pulling out a little bit has is, is still true. I didn't see Ant Man in theaters. Um, you know, there's there's just been a couple of, of, of movies that I, I just waited until they came out on Disney Plus. So I, mm-hmm. I again, I just I, I'm excited. Blue Beetle is definitely one I'm going to go see in theaters. I know it's completely opposite of, of DC. Sorry, not to turn the conversation, but no, no. But I think you should. I yeah. think you would enjoy it seeing it in theaters. Um, there, are, there, are, like Deering was one of those that I said, "Hey, you'll probably enjoy this movie, but it's not one that you're going to go see in the theaters." I know it, so just watch it when it comes to streaming. Sure. And that's that's my recommendation of like, hey, this movie is worth watching. You should watch it if you have the time, the money, the resources to go and see it in theaters. Go see it in theaters because you're supporting the actors that it, you know, and the directors and it, and the writers, everybody that worked on the movie that they can't sit there and advertise for it. But if you, you know, can't do that right now for whatever reason, watch it when it goes to streaming because it it actually is a good movie. You'll you'll enjoy it if you like the superhero genre sweet um you know we've kind of uh gone on for a while about the other thing so we're gonna hopefully switch to the next uh topic in hand shift, shift gears, shift gears a little games. bit yeah <laughs> got in got, we got we got into the the nerdy movie talk right? <laughs> <laughs> it happened again we're, we'll do a big movie recap at the end of the year too because i've been i've been writing down a list of all the the movies that i've seen so far in 2023 so We'll, we'll do a movie talk, a big movie talk at the end of the year. Yeah. Uh, but let's let's jump into it. So we we've got Diablo talk and Boulder Skate talk to kind of wrap up today's episode. So do you want to start with Diablo? Oh, oh, brother, do I have some Diablo things hey. to say? Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, let's go. Uh, so it is with a heavy heart <laughs> that I must uh, I must express my my next few feelings uh, through words. I I don't. No. Well, actually, I do know what's been happening. Blizzard, in the last couple of years, um, has just had a bad tendency to just completely take a dump on gold mines. Um, I thought Diablo 4, when it released, was so good. I really liked Lost Ark. I thought it was um, going... I was. I, I thought it was going to do really, really well. And I thought, for a very long time, when I was playing it at the beginning... I thought it was going to be in direct competition with Path of Exile 2. Because we know mm-hmm. that those two games, like Lost Ark, Path of Exile, Diablo 4, they're all very similar games. And they kind of fight with one another for for a position at the table. And Path of Exile has a huge fan base. Chino could talk for months about this. Like his entire podcast. I see him playing it right <laughs> now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that too. Um, and it, it it's just frustrating. So... Game came out, everything was really cool, all the classes felt great, so on. And then we started getting some patches. And these patches did a bunch of different things. They started to nerf some classes. Then we got a big nerf patch that nerfed everything and made all the content way harder. So it like diminished a lot of people's farm gear and things. And, and for the most part, I'm just complaining about little minor things. You were still able to kind of um, make some tweaks work on it, you were still relatively okay. But for some bills and certain things, completely bombed them, completely dropped them into, and if you follow the tiers, completely bombed them to like S, not, not S tier, sorry, click bottom to like bottom of the tier. <clears throat> and then what does Blizzard do on top of that? They start just like doubling down on the choices they made without listening to the, to the general public. And then on top of that, what else do they do to piss people off even more? They start shoving down the cash shop down our throats. 
So, like, the entire experience of Diablo has gone from, like, man, this game is really, really good to it's a sinking ship. Buy as many skins as you can before the game goes to the shitter. <laughs> so it's been really frustrating and really bad experience for me because, like, everything, you come in shop. Hey, the shop. Hey, the shop. Hey, the shop. And it's like, fix your fucking game, and then you can ask me for more money. <laughs> like... <laughs> right, 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 right. It's it, yeah, like you're you're not you're not listening to us, mm. Blizzard. That's part of the problem. Yeah, yeah. And and anyone, I I know there's opposing point of views. I know some people have voiced through uh, if it were content creators through Reddit through a different you know the the growing pains of this kind of game. And I totally understand that and accept that and 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 respect that for the longevity of the game, certain things need to happen to preserve its you know power creep and curve power curve and everything of, of, of that nature my main point that i've had an issue with diablo is it feels real bad in a game to come out strong feel powerful as a character go into it be like i'm a wizard or i'm a sorcerer i can blow shit up and then have that completely taken away from you where you literally a monster sneezes in your direction you instantly die and it doesn't matter whether if it's for the longevity of the game or not it's frustrating to see that our power, the character's power is being taken away from them and all your work that you put in just basically is like, oh, sorry, just do it again or figure out a different way to fix it. And then the, the, the other issue I've really had with the game has just been like the power scaling between the different classes and there's no seasons in terms of like pushing and leaderboards or anything like that. So there's really no, no like uh, merit behind feeling like your class is less powerful than another because it's not you know it's not being tracked in any way but it does feel bad to be like oh cool i'm a sorcerer my all my nerves got bit, uh buffed or all my nerves all my bills got nerfed and hey man i just cleared a 30 you're like oh great bro i got blues and yellows and i'm clearing 60s you're know, like and that feels real bad <laughs> but go ahead man I'd, I'd love to hear kind of your opinion on everything i know you haven't played too much no, of the season because like, that's 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 my thing. It's like I was enjoying the game a lot when it first came out. I played a lot. I was really sucked in. It's like I loved what they did to it. And then they released the season, and I tried it for a little bit, and I just was not invested in the season at all. And I was just like, I don't know. And I, I think it was like all happening at once of – you know, the big nerf to everything, the big changes to everything season immediately gets released. And then it was just like, I just am not enjoying the season season grind as much as I was enjoying playing on my other character. And so then I'd find myself just being like, when I would log into Diablo, I'm just going to go play on my other character. And, and even then, like you said, it doesn't have that same feeling of like, Oh, I'm pushing the keys or I'm doing these things. And I just feel like it's not, it doesn't have that same, uh, you know, effect that it did when the game first came out. And I know they, you know, changed drop rates and they did all these things to it, but it just like, I, if I'm feeling this and I know a lot of people fell off before then, right. A lot of our friend group pushed completely the game, the campaign, and then just stopped playing after that. Like they didn't even push further. Like my goal is at least to play and try to get to level hundred. Cause I haven't done that yet. But it's like, I, if the seasons are going to keep looking like this, which cool, you have extra story, you know, you've got these hearts and stuff like that and, and new adaptions to spells and changes. That's cool, but I'm not as, as interested in, in that side of things. I don't know. I, I It's like I don't know what they can do to keep people interested and invested, and I feel like the people that are still playing it are probably people that did not play Boulder's Gate or did not get hooked on other games or just like, you know, they have a group that they – play with and that and that's their game right now but it's like i know people are still playing it but i know a lot of people are not playing it anymore yeah and that's the other thing too it, it i don't know the season the season feels like it was a bit rushed out um, that's what it is really right? yeah it feels like it came out really early um i also felt like the balancing with the game has just been all over the place um things are getting buffed and nerfed left and right um, and just it, it just doesn't feel good as a player it doesn't feel good to put all this time and effort into a character come back you know a couple days later and I, I think 
what's really annoyed me with the the Diablo developing development team, quote unquote, has been that they're like, yeah, we want to be transparent about everything, and then for a while there, they were just patching changes without letting anybody know. So they're mm-hmm. like secret nerfs, there were secret changes to things, um, item drop rates were were modified uh, or not communicated properly, like, and if you're trying to go for the transparency, just just actually communicate what's going on. I know like Nan has heard me complain about this multiple times with Diablo, um, the super secret rare items that, that uh, you know, people were hunting for and I think like only a couple people in the world ended up getting. Cool, you wanna have a super rare item? That's not a problem. How about you at least release the information that doesn't affect whether they drop or not and let us know at what level can they start dropping so that we know when to potentially expect a chance at the lottery versus thinking that once I hit 50, I'm already enrolled. You know, I already have right. a chance at winning versus not having a chance at all. Um, and, and again, I, I, for me personally, the biggest issue I've had with the entire game from when it started to where, where it is now is really liking a class, really putting the time into it, really working to make it better, and then... Either there's one type of build, so there's no build diversity in terms of the power yeah. scaling for classes, or B, the build that you like gets nerfed into the ground, but then you don't buff things accordingly to make it. And they're, they're slowly kind of tuning it that way, and I think over the long run, they'll get Diablo 4 where Diablo 3 was, because it took them a while to get it right. But I think by that point, they will have pissed off enough people where I think it's going to hurt them. And, and it's showing because of how desperate they are with trying to get transactions through the store and everything that they're doing to try to generate revenue for the game while they're quote unquote fixing things for us. And Path of Exile 2 is around the corner. And man, I don't know if you've seen any videos or seen some of the content stuff that's being released for it. It looks mm, amazing. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was going to give Diablo a run for its money if Diablo wasn't completely taking a dump on itself. And <laughs> now, POE2 is, is, if it stays on target, it delivers what I've seen and what I've read and all the things that I'm, I'm really excited for. I think it's going to just literally devastate Lost Ark and devastate uh, Diablo 4. And I don't know that they'll be able to recover, in my personal opinion. Uh, I think I think you're right. I, and, you know, I, I don't know if it was like, you know, them trying to capture all of the streamers and try to keep them in the game by releasing the season so early or or what? Like, I don't know. It's like I feel like giving and maybe they had the stats on it maybe they knew it's like x amount of players are level 100 or something like that. sure or x amount of players have finished the campaign or, and you know I, I and and maybe there's they were seeing a huge uptick in the amount of people that had reached 100 and they go oh we need to make sure we release the season now for them so they stay playing and stay in the game but i just feel like it i don't know the the big nerfs and like like you said it, it seems like everyone's trying to do different things and nobody's on the same page on on what to do for, for this game anymore. I don't know. Well, and, and you said it, you mentioned the streamers, man. Like, it, it feels like a lot of the game was kind of tailored to the small mass instead of the larger masses. Because, like, for example, the experience mm-hmm. nerves that they had for, for all the all leveling in general and just how that scales. Like, they completely nerfed experience to the ground and they made it a lot more difficult for casual gamers to play. So, like... We have a friend who likes to play Diablo, but he has a family and he works and it's a lot harder for them to be able to get enough time to effectively grind at the level that other people are grinding. And now for that person, it's impossible for them to get to the max level because the experience, even if you played night and day, is still very hard to max out the level and have that level 100 character that everyone that enjoys the game is hoping to get to. So... Blizzard, in my opinion, is just killing, <laughs> is killing, and, and they've done this. This is just, this is normal with them. I'm not surprised. I'm I'm more annoyed that it just keeps happening than like, oh my goodness, yeah. how shocked am I? They, they did it to Warcraft 3 Remake. They mm-hmm. ruined that. They ruined all the other games that they do. It, it's just, it's a typical 
Blizzard Monday. And uh, yeah, and that's sad just to, to to think about that. That's just the norm for it. But I I don't know. I you know I I feel like we will probably talk about Diablo again uh, before the end of the year. But we're not going to be spending the same amount of time on Diablo that we have previously right like right know, i see i see you're still playing it every now and again i know i'm gonna because like my i i am gonna get to 100 before the end of the year but i it's i'm not gonna be committing the same hours that i did play previously and i don't foresee myself really playing seasons uh anymore and it's funny like even with the season like they're like ah oh, buy the battle pass or whatever you get more rewards because like the free rewards that you get are just like here's a red shirt and red pants or whatever. <laughs> yeah. it's not even it's not even good rewards for the free so it's like what's the point of me even playing the season if i'm not even going to get good rewards if i'm not spending the money you're, you're basically saying i have to spend the, the money on the battle pass if i want it and it's like well even then it's like some of the armor looked cool but it's also there didn't really seem to be any distinct difference mm -hmm. based on my class on what the armor set looked like. It just seemed like everybody's wearing the same metal, right? Uh, it's metal with spikes. That's cool. I wanted some, some thing that made my character feel unique for playing the season and not just running around and saying, I can't really tell the difference between all the classes now that we're all wearing this metal battle pass set, you know? Well... To be fair, Dan, if you're a sorcerer or a assassin, the biggest difference is a cape. <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> Stuff like that. <laughs> like, <laughs> woohoo! A cape. Mm -hmm. oh, I don't know. It's silly. It's I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Diablo. I I like Diablo. It was very cool for that window because it it did seem like everybody mm -hmm. was playing it. Right. And then, and then it just burned out so quickly. And I, and maybe that's the the norm now, right? For games, maybe in the in the world of streaming, in the world of, that we live in, of it's like you get like a two to three month window, and you try to capture as many people in that window as possible. I don't think we're gonna be in the state of people are gonna be playing a game for six months to a year anymore. I don't think I don't think it's gonna happen. I think it's going to be like you can hope that you can capture them for this small window and then you hope that you can get them to come back later with a season or some other thing, right? Like Path to Exile, Chino's always playing the new seasons of it. Like he's coming back, oh, I'm going to push this and do this for a while. And then he goes off and, and plays other games, right? We we did it every so often with Diablo 3 for the seasons. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, you know what? Let's spend the weekend and we'll, we'll play a season and, and stuff. But it's like... It's it's not going to be the same same way of everyone's playing this for six months. I don't think. Yeah, I I I, I really like that point. Um, you know, because that's also going to be a really good uh, kind of transition into into the next game we'll talk about. But I, I really do agree and like that point of I don't think. I mean, you got to think about our general attention span with anything in general. Uh, it isn't just video games, and it isn't you know limited to anyone who who. Who has a limited attention uh, span? It it is just in general as a society nowadays. It's really hard to maintain that, you know, interest or 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 grab the the, you know, I I think about it in, in terms of like movies, right? You could get buzz around a movie, like let's use the Barbie movie for example. People are still mm -hmm. talking about it. Uh, my fiance and I are, are, are also going to go see it because she saw it with her sister and, and really enjoyed it. And um, so, but there's a limit. There's a cap on how much everyone's going to talk about it, how much everyone's going to do it. And that's why once that kind of ends, a movie goes from the movie theater to a DVD, right? So I think games are kind of following that same trend of, yeah, this game is really popular. It's so it's so awesome. Everyone's playing it. You see it on Twitch, like. For Diablo 4, everyone was streaming Diablo. It like crawled mm. to like the number one mm. or number two outside of like the competitive games. And that's my final point with this is I think where that may be a little bit of a, a, of a variance or a difference is going to be with games that have a very high competitive nature. Um, and those will stay around for a longer time because there is a like hierarchy in terms of rising the ranks for best players and a lot of people seek that when they play games is that competitive nature of that game to 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 shoot for and play for and and go on because like you can sit here and grind the game all day 
Diablo, for example, you get all the gear. Once you get all the gear, at least in the first season, there's nothing else to do. At least with Diablo 3, you had the leaderboard. So like you're trying to push right. the leaderboard and you could like, man could be like, I want to be the number one necromancer, uh, you know, this week. So he plays all mm-hmm. the week, mm-hmm. gets to like get greater rift level 88 or whatever. And then you're five ahead. You probably quit for a week because <laughs> no one's going to get to, to your level unless they're pushing. So right. I, I agree. I, I think i essentially, I really thought that was a really good point because I, I, I really do think that a lot of games are are like that and if they're popular enough they're going to get hype and then the hype's going to die they'll be back but i don't see that that parabola kind of staying on a uh pretty even standard deviation in terms of movement and such so we'll we'll see um we'll we'll definitely see with diablo (laughs) yeah 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 yeah. that's that's gonna be interesting to see and and you know like i said we will probably talk about it again but it's not gonna be you know it's not worth it every podcast episode to necessarily highlight diablo unless there's some big changes and big things right because there might be and then then we'll, we'll go over it but for the most part you know there's other games there's other stuff happening that we're gonna talk about and there is a new game to talk about that one that uh I'd say a lot of the people that were playing Diablo pivoted into, and even the people that weren't playing Diablo got really excited to play this. So we're talking about Boulder's Gate 3, which, is, of course, if you are a D&D nerd, you should know. Also, it's the third one, so there's been other games. You did not have to have played the other games to appreciate this game. So, you know, just just so like little preference of what we're going to be talking about uh for the next stuff but you have been playing it you've been doing it with a group you've been doing it solo so kind of why don't you why don't you dive into it and and lead us off with what what your initial thoughts are for the game both as a solo player as well as as a group player sure um i cannot say and and i and, and anyone who's been listening to us from the beginning uh i tend to do this so i'm super hyped for it I'm going to talk it up a lot. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, if this frustrates you, I apologize. That's just my nature. Um, <laughs> kind of same thing happened with Diablo. I talked it up really bad. Or, or you know, I, I talked it up a lot. And now here we are kind of, you know, we spent good 10 minutes, you know, shitting on it. Uh, <laughs> but that's the nature of games. And that's the nature of content that lives over a longer span of time. Things can, you know, have ups and downs and sometimes crashes right into the the center of the fucking earth um Mm -hmm. i absolutely love the game uh i love everything about it i love the um the storytelling element um i love the characterization that they've done and the characters that they've created the world um that that they've basically brought us into um if you are able to run high graphics and, and things of that nature. Uh, the world is beautiful. Combat is beautiful. Um, I personally have been playing the game on Tactician, which is the hardest difficulty. Um, mm. At the beginning, I was a little bit concerned about the replayability of the game. Um, I know there's so many different uh, scenarios, but now that I've played both with a party and solo, Um, a lot of things tend to overlap so there is a little bit of repetition because it's impossible to create an absolutely different experience when the gist of the game is kind of the same right the 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 core of the story follows the same pattern even though the choices and everything Mm -hmm. affect how you get there and and you can do so many different things with the game um customization is amazing between characters the classes um i think what i've really really liked about the game and I would highlight the what as one of my favorite if not the best thing I think they've done is they've taken a game and they've infused the world of Dungeons and Dragons into it so well that I was talking about this earlier where they've created a bridge between those who haven't really been into or haven't played D&D as well and those who have but may have not touched the game to have a conversation, meaning I, after having played the game, want to try D&D. And now that I've played this game and understand some of the basic mechanics of it, 
feel like I can go up to a D and D player and say, I would like to try D and D. Can you, you know, I made a character. You have the ability to do like quote unquote a character sheet and develop your character, create its backstory and such. I feel like it sets me up a little bit better to go up to a D&D player or join a D&D campaign and partake in, in the adventure as well as what it also does is it allows D&D, hardcore D&D players <coughs> to kind of cross the bridge to the other side as well. So then you, for example, let's say that you're just a you're straight D&D player, have never played this game. We could play together. You could come and, and buy it, download it, and we could almost kind of have our own D and D campaign, experience it together, and then maybe you know branch off from that. And I would go to the other side and join a D and D campaign and, and have it. So I think I was when when I first heard about this game three years ago when it was first released and they did their early release, <coughs> I was really annoyed. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest with everybody. I was really annoyed. I was really annoyed because we've really gotten into this habit, or not us, I'm sorry, but, but studios and, and companies have gotten really into this habit of, hey, here's early access, or here's, you know, you get to play early, and then the game tanks, or the game is, is not good, or you only get access to half the content, and then you're stuck with a game that you would have otherwise not bought had you seen the full release. This mm-hmm. game, when it first came out, it was only you could only play it through the first act. It was limited amount of classes, um, and it was received fairly well. But they had a lot of time to work. They 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 had some things to work on. They took the next three years <coughs> to hear the feedback, work on it, and really execute a game that has delivered on so many fronts. It hit like. I think it was what one weekend or a week, man. It hit uh, Steam's ten top most played games just in the first yes. week or a weekend of of, yep. of uh, being out, and it just showcases what a studio is capable of in the level of quality of product they can deliver if they listen to feedback and deliver what people want to play and give you a customizable experience because that's the beauty of Dungeons and Dragons is you get to create your world. You get to explore it how you want and you get to enjoy it with the people you want. And they're, the boundaries between how you explore and how you develop and how you do everything are, are, are endless. And correct me if I'm wrong, as you are the, the, the actual D&D player and so on. You know, I've played a little bit in the past, nowhere near as much as Nan, who has way more experience. It's always been a little bit more frightening for me to get into it because there's the character creation, there's the elements, there's the actions, there's understanding it. And I've really felt for me personally, Baldur's Gate has been kind of like a tutorial for getting into Dungeons and Dragons. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> no, I, I think that's that's a good way to look at it, especially because of how intertwined it it like Baldur's Gate three is D and D as it as it is today right yes the D that we're used to which is fifth edition that's currently out you know i've played D for years now i played back in, in three and 3.5 and four and five you know but i i've played in high school a lot played in college so i've, I've played a lot and and the the way that it sets it up because it's all still based off of the stats and rolling the dice and stuff like that. Like, you can see the dice rolls so you know what's happening. So it's not like the the stuff that happens in Boulder Gate is d- directly translates, and the skills that you're practicing in Boulder's Gate in that regard uh, directly translate. And I think it was a shift for a lot of people, too, to go from, like, oh, I'm going to try to, you know go into this room and fight these monsters or, you know, not pay attention to my environment and get screwed over and, and having to like uh, go back to save points and try again kind of thing, which I know some people are, are playing that way. Some people are, are, you know, just trying to explore and learn and say here, whatever happens, happens, you know, depending on what DM you're with, they will be like, are we going to, hold fast and hard to some of the rules that like hey your character you do this you're you know have a good chance of dying and then you're going to have to make a new character right or is your dm going to be having a little bit more flexibility and say hey you know we're collectively telling a story together so you there is a little bit of a cushion that unless you're being really dumb or doing something your character 
you know, doesn't have the same threat level initially uh, of dying, right? Like within the first couple of sessions, but it's, it's cool to see how connected. And like you said, people that normally wouldn't touch D and D cause there's that stigma of, ah, I'm not going to role play and stuff are getting really into this game. <laughs> so I, you know, it's, it's on my radar and it's on my wish list of going, I wish I had time to commit and play this game. It's going to be one that I will pick up in the future and play, but it's like, I just don't have time to, to, commit to it sadly yeah and it's funny you say that because it is it is a it is a time commitment it, it really is uh especially with the harder difficulty um because the 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 combat is i mean it's it's dice based right um so you could have a really good battle as i i've had a couple where everything went my way and then i've had other battles where it didn't and i've died and had to go back and tackle it from a different perspective because (laughs) um you know you you just it it didn't go your way um i I think the other thing that i've really appreciated that the studio uh larian larian studios right Mm -hmm. um yes developed is so so they've had some practice they did uh original sin uh, Divinity Original Sin and Divinity Original Sin 2. Which is another good game. Which are great yeah. games, great way of storytelling. So they did such a good way of incorporating uh, the Dungeons & Dragons mechanics into a game in a way that, that is simple to understand. And they've added a couple little like bits of training wheels in there as well to, to help, again, bridge that gap between someone who's been playing for years and someone who barely knows it, right? Um mm-hmm. I just have to I have to give them kudos for all the business decisions they've made, uh, taking time to develop their game and, and deliver us a quality product. Um, they also um, moved the is I, I don't know if it, I'm sure a lot of people kind of heard this one. So this is part of me being uh, repetitive and redundant on information. But um, one thing that I really thought was a brilliant a business decision is their game was originally due to release around the same time Starfield was going to. Uh, and then it was going to release, which is the first week of September, I believe. And that's a really big anticipated game uh, by a lot of people, myself included. And I think that had the game released as intended with everyone, it would have been a little bit overshadowed by others who would love to check this game out, but equally wanted to check out Starfield, you know, and, and do that mm. space exploration. So what did they do? They literally pushed the release date for PC a month early and just worked harder to make the same level of, of, of con or to deliver the level of content as if they had had another month. So they took a month less to deliver. Or they they, they uh, reduced the time they had they still delivered a quality product, and I mean the numbers kind of speak for the results. So I'm I'm really happy to see that there's still smaller businesses, quote unquote. I use this, the the word smaller kind of conservative yeah, studios, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that are making smart decisions instead of just trying the the EA approach or the. Uh, Activision but I approach. think I think there is something to be said about the fact that they are smaller mm-hmm. and they can make those choices, right? Where they go, you know, we don't have necessarily a board to answer <laughs> to of saying you need to release this by quarter three so we could get maximum profits out of this. Or, you know, like it's like, oh, no, we know what's best for us and our game will be to wait. And that's that's huge. I don't know. I like the. The stuff that I see about the game is very cool. Um, I like I dig it that how intertwined and connected it is. Um, have you all the characters that you're playing? Are they all uh, pre-made or custom-made? Like, have you m- done any of that fluctuation, like with the character creation stuff? Yeah. So, so it's 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 really cool um, how how they did it is. Uh, they put two kind of things in here, and, and I know the hardcore D&D fans might hate what I'm about to say, and that's okay. Um, but they added a, without spoiling the game, they added in a way to respec any of the characters. And then mm-hmm. you can make them whatever you want. So in theory, in theory, you could respec all four characters and make them all fighters. Or make them, you know, if you wanted to fight, if you wanted to beat the game with four berserkers, you could, in theory, respect them all and make them all berserkers. 
So the characters each have their story and how they look. So you can't change, you can't customize Gale or, or one of the other characters that, that you uh, meet early in the story, but you can change the classes. So for example, when you encounter Gale in, in the story uh, or in the game, he's a wizard. And right. I went and respect him to a sorcerer because I wanted some of the perks that the sorcerer got instead versus the glass can wizard that I just wasn't enjoying. And, and I know you'll know, man, because you've played D&D. <laughs> it doesn't sound like there's many differences, but there are. And they're very noticeable. Right. <laughs> Um, no, 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 but that's that's true. Like when you think about it, you're like, oh, w- w- how much of a difference can it be? They like they have thought about this system and the nuances to make each yes. of the classes feel unique enough that even though they might not sound that unique, you know, it is. Uh, you know, th- there are enough significant differences to to make it worthwhile of, of changing it. Now, are do do you have a character that is your like main? like charisma talking to people character and is that the character that you're playing or is that somebody else in your party yeah so interestingly enough my main charisma character is uh gail who was a wizard Mm -hmm. then he was a necromancer for me and i wasn't a huge fan of necromancy clad would disagree uh our friend zach would would disagree with me he's he has a necromancer he's loving it um but yeah, I, he's my charisma uh, person. That, well, now he's my charisma person because I switched him to uh, Sorcerer and I believe their, their primary mm-hmm. stat is, is charisma. Um, my main character, I, I'm usually the one that, that's, unless I know that like a charisma thing is going to come up, is my paladin. Uh, and mm-hmm. interestingly enough, I wasn't enjoying the paladin until the later levels. So now I'm I'm almost level six and I wasn't really liking it at the beginning because it was like it felt so slow and clunky and it definitely had that slow burn feel of like holy moly um what's going on something I'll smite it and otherwise I'm just kind of happy to be here yeah and and, and funny I I made mine a vengeance paladin because when I was playing Mm. in the group I saw just how much our friend was struggling to stay in the light side of the paladin like the the whatever the uh, mm. the good good paladin is the good boy paladin yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. so like it was funny because every that's the other thing that they've done a really good job uh, a good job with is how each of the decisions you make whether you get a good roll or a bad roll or, or whether it was a decision and dialogue that you made or a roll that just didn't go your way how those things come back up later in the story um, and also just how like certain things happen that cause a different effect. So for example, when we were playing our, our four player game with, with our friend who's, who's the good boy paladin, every, we have to be careful what we did because bad actions of the party would affect his oath. And basically, I think it was, it, the joke was that within like 20 minutes of us playing together, I think he broke his oath. He had the, <laughs> he, he literally, I think we he killed someone we him. weren't supposed, oh yeah, that's what it was. We killed someone we weren't supposed to, and he already had two strikes against him for some stuff that we didn't pay attention to earlier. We killed something we weren't supposed to, and then he got a vision of someone who was going to pay him a visit, and then he became an oathbreaker, and he didn't want to, so we didn't yeah. to reload. <laughs> now, I know that there's a lot of people who play these games or play similar games like that, and, and um, I think they, I think the proper term for it is scum saving. I know that there's a lot of people that are mm-hmm. against it, and they're like, no, huh? but. You know, for people who are just trying to have fun, learn the game, this was a way for us to kind of like explore different options. And he wanted to be a good boy paladin. He didn't want to become a death knight just because, you know, we accidentally killed someone uh, and, and so on. So it, it, that's the thing that I would, I would, that's been my main argument against that whole thing. It's like, just be mindful that there's a specific like lore and story that people want to follow with their character. And sometimes certain decisions kind of, ruin that for you and if you don't want to play a particular class you just kind of have to be careful about that so i'm although i don't necessarily super agree with it i understand it's it's emphasis i also try to do as little of that as i can but Mm -hmm. there are situations where it's unavoidable where hence i died because 
I just died and there's, I don't have any other choice. I have to reload. There's, there's nothing you can do. <laughs> like, I, my game isn't over. I'm not going to start over because I died. So like I, 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 I can see both sides. But yeah, no, it's, it's – I'm honestly probably – being being honest with everybody, I'm gonna be playing here here in a little bit after I take care of some things and 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 continue my story around it. Nice, yeah. Like it seems like a lot of fun, and it, and like you said, there's enough nuances in it that yes, there's similarities if you play it uh, more than once. But it's like you said that the actions that you do come back and matter later in the game too. So there's, I, f- I feel like there's plenty of hours that you can put in the game. Like, because you guys haven't beaten it yet, have you? No, uh, well, so that's the sad news is our, our four man group kind of died. Um, uh, but I know that like Chris has the game and and Clad was mentioning it, so I, I I do want to do like a full playthrough, um, like in the normal difficulty with a group of four, uh, because I think that that's that's the other thing I would mention about the game. It is definitely a different feel as it should be when you're playing by yourself and controlling four individual characters than when you're playing with a group. Because there's a lot of like you're on Discord or whatever your uh, communication tool is, and you're verbalizing things of like, hey, I wonder what would this do, or hey, Chino, you should do this. Hey, Patrick, do this. Hey, I need a heal. Can you help me out? So like you're you're coordinating together. Whereas like if you're playing by yourself, you're just sitting there. All right, heal me. You know, do this, do that. And mm. both have their pros and cons. And I've I, I've enjoyed both. I've I've enjoyed going in the hardest difficulty. And having to think of clever ways to defeat enemies because they're going to just beat the shit out of you either regardless versus being in a party and trying to like let them explore the game but also like coordinating with them on clever solutions to beat the bosses and so on so it's it's it it has i was really worried that it wasn't going to have a lot of replayability i think it's a game that definitely does have a good amount of replayability so if you're kind of on the fence about whether you want to invest it or not it is you're going to get a lot of hours out of this game uh even after i beat it i'm going to go through a different i'm going to play again through again and then i'm going to use the classes that i hadn't used before so like i really want to try the druid i want to see what the ranger can do um i haven't i'm using the cleric and not a bard so i'd like to see kind of the big difference between cleric mm-hmm. and bard uh, Paladin feels broken, so I won't play with Paladin again because I feel like <laughs> there's been a lot of scenarios where I was, you know, at the beginning, I was like, man, I'm just going to bench the Paladin. This sucks. I'm going to respect it. And then Paladin really, once it, it got to level three or four, I think, I just started really yeah, I was going to say, what what was it, the like, what spell or what ability did you get around there that you really connected with and felt, felt good about so, it? So... I think the two things that really changed the game for me in terms of the melee fighters. So, so my party is paladin, fighter, uh, sorcerer, and cleric. Um, and I believe it's the the I have a vengeance paladin. I have a battle master fighter, or uh, I think that's what it's called, battle battle something. Um, I have a uh, dragon based sorcerer with a focus on fire because I just want to basically cast fireballs until I run out of uh, out of spell slots. Uh, that makes sense. The big thing was the spell slots. Uh, with Paladin, it, it just mm. felt like... And I was using a one-hander and a shield, so that was kind of my ignorance of learning how to play. And Like, no, my Paladin can be a two-handed beat down to, to death. Um, yeah, it, it, it felt like once you started to get more spell slots, more, uh, you know, different types of equipment and things like that, the game felt more um it felt less difficult to try to navigate because like on the on the tactician uh mode it costs double the amount of resources to do a long sleep and the enemies are harder obviously but it as you get more levels it felt a bit easier to go into a fight and think about how you could do that fight without just using up all your resources because as you know, once you've used your limited number of spells, you have to get a long rest to be able to refill all your spells and be able to use it again. So it was a, it's been a really interesting like learning when and when not to do it, what number, and. Mm. 
Yes, yeah, that makes sense. Like you, you have you. Yes. Once you get used to yes. it, though, does it feel easier? And I also would argue, then? as the classes level in, in any game, this is going to kind of be a dumb statement to say out loud, but in in any game, as the classes get higher, the content feels a little bit easier to navigate because you have more options, you have more choices, and it definitely feels like that with Baldur's Gate. The more levels, the more accessibility to spell slots and classes and things like that, perks, um, feats, and things like that. It 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 adds to that power level and feeling like you can navigate it a little bit better, especially on the harder difficulty where, you know, I've now done part of the game in balance and part of the game in tactician and it's noticeable differences. Mobs, <laughs> mobs go from like, Hey, this hurts to like just obliterating your face. Like it is, it's, it's a noticeable difference, but it's a good difference. Like it, it, I think what I've really enjoyed about playing solo versus with the group is in solo mode, I've had to come up with more interesting and clever ways to approach a fight than just get in there and battle it. You know, instead of just running around the grass fighting Pokemon and killing them to get my points, it's been like, all right, let me divvy up the team and let's put my, you know, let's put my sorcerer up on the high ground and have my paladin be the person who hits the first strike or do you know look around and see okay what's going to happen in this scenario and, and obviously it can go a lot of the fights can go pretty pretty south but i think that's the other thing that's been really cool with Baldur's skate is thinking about how you approach it and just like how much charisma diplomacy and all those kind of things factor into the game and how you can change the outcome of a oh i'm gonna you know something as simple as going into a village and oh, I'm going to have to kill everyone here in this village and murder hobo my way through versus, hey, by the way, I did an intimidation check and they're too scared to do anything so I can just pass through. And then I find that maybe there's an enemy here I have to kill and I'm in the perfect position to like off a couple enemies before I encounter them and so on. So I really enjoyed that tactical element of the game of having to really think through uh, the choices I'm making versus Nan can vouch for this when I've played D&D in the past. I've been pretty much a run in and ask questions later kind of guy. <laughs> a wild card, yeah. No, but I think that's it's like I I think it's also because you have learned the you know threat is real of like if I don't spend the time to think and plan and yes. try to find the angles, my characters die. And that's a pain in the butt to deal with. Uh, where regular D and D, the the threat is real sometimes, but you know sometimes people go, oh, you know, they don't they 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 do the collective, you know, same team. Let's try to get through this together. Where you know I have specific D and D campaigns that the whole goal oh. is to try to kill the Ooh. players, and their whole goal is to try to stay alive and get out of you know, travel through the dungeon and traverse it and get out of it, right? So, like, there, there's definitely, pro, you know, di different ways that you want to play it. Like, one-shots are really good for that because you're like, all right, let's see if you could survive this one-shot. But if you're doing an ongoing story, you know, you're less likely to want to try to kill off a player if you can, you know, some sometimes the dice come up and the dice come up and you go, well, <laughs> you just got hit for 20 damage. And you're like, well, I'm a, a, a squishy mage that <laughs> just, like, am now dead. So... Sometimes that happens. I don't know. I t but if if I play Baldur's Gate and my goal is when I do, Ooh. is I'm and if I get a party, which my hope is to get a party, is to just say, hey, let's set up, you know, an hour every Sunday or two hours every other Sunday or something to play almost like D and D together. Of let's just get together, we'll play for an hour or two every week, and and that's the only time that we'll play it, it, like our group game essentially. And hopefully, because, you know, the part, hardest part of D&D, &D, which you found out firsthand with your group, is yes. scheduling yes. time and that's to the play of with too, a group. It's like <laughs> whoever starts the main file can hold on to the main file and then people can join into it and play it at their, at their pace. Um, I think the other funny thing about combat in general, too, is I, I think this game has done a good job of, of helping me plan worst case scenario. Because I think that was one thing that I wasn't thinking about it when I first started playing was, oh, cool, it didn't hit. There's no there's no big deal here. Whereas, like, you can have the dice 
go pretty bad, you know, and they have, essentially the game has a, um, there's a setting that you can turn off if you want to be super hardcore about this, uh, that gives you like bad luck protection. So after you have enough bad dice, you start to get better rolls on your dice to help you prevent from like having a, an atrocious combat. Let's say you're in like fighting a, a, a band of gnolls or whatever, and you just, you roll twos and threes and fours just like forever and you just get completely wiped out. The game has essentially a built-in thing to protect you so you start getting some hits. But what I've really enjoyed and what it's made me have to do is think about worst case scenarios. So I want to try to kill these two enemies first. They're the biggest threat. You know, the whole, we talk about this in Magic and joke about it sometimes, threat assessment. These are the things that need to die. What can I do to best set myself up so that if I don't kill them, I'm not going to die. <laughs> and, and that's so cool because there's some scenarios yeah, in the game yep, yep, yep. where like you kind of have, it forces you to play that way. The whole game forces you to really have to think outside the box. And I'm really excited and looking forward to when when you, and I'm guessing I know who you want, you know, who else is going to play on you. If I get a spot, I will, I will be super thrilled because I love to like, see that and would love to see kind of everybody's stop process to these fights and how they differ mm -hmm. from what I've done to get them done and what other people do to get them done and, and clear and I think that's my closing point for why I love this game so much is that there isn't a one clear and easy way to do it and even if you try the same way that like for example I could share my strategy for one boss fight with Nan he could try it and it could go to shit because the dice roll don't go his way or I could try his way or I wouldn't be able to try his way because his party makeup is different so I have to find my own approach to it so there's so many different angles so many different right. aspects to the game that make it so unique every time you play and and you have so many different ways to enjoy it and and if you haven't had a chance to check it out, I cannot say enough good things about it. This is one of those games where I promise you I will not be shit talking it later. It's gonna get it's gonna get good reviews from me from the start. It's gotten good reviews uh, <laughs> as I'm still playing it. I'm gonna continue to play it. It'll be a game that I'm sure we're gonna bring up multiple times in, in our podcast in the future. And it's it's a nine point five out of ten for me. I love that. That's great. So yeah, like you said, we are going to keep talking about it uh, at some point, so be, be prepared for it. But let's kind of wrap it up uh, with how we normally end the podcast then is, you know, what are you watching? What are you reading? We already know what you're playing. Cause sure. You um, Gate, but what are you watching? What are you reading what right now? I would say what we've been watching and gotten into is uh, Ozarks. Um, so in case nobody's familiar with it without spoiling too much, it's mm -hmm. uh, essentially mm -hmm. about... Uh, a family that moves to the Ozarks and is laundering money for the cartel. Um, it's just a, I don't know. I, I personally find it rather interesting. It's been good to kind of see the dynamics of, of people and just kind of like the, the, the premise of it that I really enjoy and why I think my attention is still with the show is the moral compass that tends to fluctuate between like, what you're doing, what's bad, what's worse, and what line you're not willing to cross, right? Because like, there's there's no scenario in this story where like money laundering is okay or doing like certain things. It's kind of like Breaking Bad, right? There's there's that level of like relatability in terms of like how far yes, would you yeah. cross and at what point do you stop or what line do you continue to move forward to? I love it. I, I really, really like it. We've been... Uh, uh, enjoying that quite a bit. And then the other one that I would highly recommend is ZOM 100, which is an anime uh, that is out on Netflix. Um, we talked a little bit about, well, we didn't talk, we didn't get a chance to talk about this, but essentially the story is uh, the main character joined an exploitative corporation in Japan. And as we were kind of talking about the writer strike and, and the actor strike that's happening, it kind of, I think that's what kind of like drew us to it slash we, we were like, hey, let's check this out. It's, it's like a new take on a zombie uh, uh, series. Really well done. Really well animated. The story's quirky. The character is very, very... Um, you, you find it very hard to not fall in love with this character. He's like the lovable idiot, but like done well. 
almost kind of like a Luffy from One Piece, but like he's he's got. It's hard to describe. Zom 100, really recommend it. World is ending. This guy has been working his entire life, or I'm sorry, he's been working for like three years of his life for for a company that's basically exploiting him, and literally the day the world ends, he quits his job and he's the happiest person in the world. Um, so that's the other one that I would highly, and it's releasing weekly or bi-weekly or however. I, I think one of the episodes just got delayed because of the uh, because of the strike, but they're coming out as as, as they can. So definitely would would recommend that. And I don't think I'm reading anything as of right now. Just the normal One Piece following and and so on. That I mean, we we are gonna do a full anime episode at some point to, to nerd out about anime so get get ready for that guys uh but you and holly uh, would really enjoy it i, I really think you would at some point but the the uh, yeah uh so the stuff that i'm watching right now uh just finished binge watching all of ted lasso uh very good just finished up season two of good omens another really good one um and Holly and I just started watching uh the Twisted Metal show. Hence, you know, we were talking about Twisted Metal earlier. Uh that just came out on Peacock. Um only like four episodes in. Um but it's it's been pretty entertaining for and has a lot of nods and like Easter eggs related to the games, uh, but also enough of a like character driven uh, story so far to to keep you invested and interested in it uh, i'm really interested to see how how it's going to go and finish up and you know it's cool cool stuff there's of course some uh cgi that's like very obvious because you know safety first you don't want all the car carnage of guns and missiles shooting around but you know it's 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 dumb fun if you're looking for a dumb fun show that's that's a good one to uh to check out as well. Uh, but uh, yeah. And then of course all the movies that I'm, I've been checking out. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's really it. You know, go, go watch some cool animes guys. We're going to do an anime episode soon. Uh, play some um, Boulder's Gate. No, I, Any I other thoughts or stuff? Kind of, wrap uh, it up. This might be one man? of the longest, if not the longest uh, <laughs> podcast we've had. Um, but yeah, no, I, I <laughs> you know, I'm excited for all the other things we're going to be talking about. Um, uh, anime and and that one's going to be probably pretty long so um you know i apologize for the length of these as they're getting longer um just because we you know we like to talk as i'm running off right now so (laughs) it happens it happens right now (laughs) so there'll be longer episodes there'll be shorter episodes right we've got those all in between of course if you want the the check out the content it's anywhere that podcasts are available so you know spread the word let people know uh we've been putting up little little clips and stuff as well on youtube youtube.com slash name man's nerd corner uh but that's gonna be it for today's episode guys thanks so much for tuning in and listening and we'll see you guys next game